video, I hope. The three types of cartilage there that I want you guys to uh, know here, uh, they differ from one another mainly by the relative amounts of elastic and collagen fibers. Okay, and you'll see there that we have hyaline cartilage, okay, which we've talked about. We've got elastic cartilage, very different, and we have fibrocartilage. And hopefully there, at the end of this, you guys would be good to go on these there. The hyaline cartilage there resembles milk glass in appearance. Forms the costal cartilage there that connects the anterior of the ribs there with the sternum. Here we're talking articulating cartilage. And in this pic here, shows chondrocyte containing lacunae surrounded there by a matrix containing modest amounts of collagen with no dark elast uh, elastic fibers there. So there's your chondrocyte within a lacunae and articulating cartilage elastic cartilage here this one here we're talking about the ear the nose you know just squishy um that's what makes up the ear the epiglot uh, the epiglottis there which is a covering uh that uh stops food from going into your respiratory tract uh within the pick here shows the darkly stained elastic fibers in the cartilage matrix Fibrocartilage there, here we're talking about the intervertebral discs, okay, they are characterized by an abundant fibrous uh, elements there within the matrix, and here the pick, it shows the dense bundles of pink stained collagen fibers here, okay, these are all your collagen fibers in here, and there's your chondrocytes there, so there are the three, you've got examples, I don't want to go too crazy on these, but definitely you'll see these there on test two for sure, uh, this slide here, is very interesting biologically um, curvatures of the spine okay um, this is scoliosis okay this is a lateral deviation of the spine and uh, I've read there in a couple of books there that we all have some degree of scoliosis now you can see in this individual here it's quite severe uh, when we have curvature of the spine at the uh, top portion there of the vertebral column it's called kyphosis in this case right here and then when you see a curve, an unusual curve there in the lower regions there, we call that lordosis. Scoliosis, kyphosis, lordosis. Moving on down the axial, here uh, we've got the sacrum, okay? And we've got the coccyx. And you'll see how they're labeled. There's five bones of the sacrum. There's four bones there of the coccyx, okay? That's all. And they're fused. Uh, they're not fused as children, but then they ossify as we get older. Okay. Thorax. Here we're talking the rib cage. Okay. The entire chest. The thorax cage consists of the bony cage, um, stern the sternum, the costal cartilage, ribs, bodies of the thoracic vertebrae. Uh, functions here is to enclose and protect all the goodies that are on the inside. Okay, as well provides uh, support there for the bones of the shoulder and upper limbs as well. Okay, you can see here that you have your true ribs. And what do I mean by true ribs? They connect, okay, directly to the manubrium, okay, to the, uh, to the body here, okay. You have the false ribs here. They come around and they connect to each other, which then connects up here. That's what we call the, the false ribs. And then we have 11 and 12, which are these floating ribs that don't articulate. They just sit there and they protect down on the lower end, okay? The 12 pairs form the sides of the thoracic cage, all attached posteriorly to bodies and transverse processes of the thoracic vertebrate column. So it, even though the floating ribs down here, they don't meet any, anything on the anterior portion, all ribs, they have an articulation there with a the vertebral column, okay? There are the true ribs, which we call the vertebral sternal, okay? And these are pairs one to seven. They attach directly to the sternum by individual costal cartilage. The false ribs there, we call those vertebral chondral, okay? That's eight to 10, okay? And they attach indirectly to the sternum by joining costal cartilage of rib above. And then we have the floating ribs here. Uh, there's no attachment other than on the posteriorly there to the vertebral column. So that's the axial in a nutshell. Moving on to the appendicular. Okay, you've seen this slide there before. 126 bones. We're going to tackle them all right now. The upper arm. Okay, you've got three long bones there. You've got the humerus, okay? 
and you've got the radius and the ulna. And how do you tell the radius from the ulna? Okay, the radius is thicker near the wrist and closer to the thumb. So if you hold your hand in anatomical position, like this right here, you know, palm up, okay, you'll see there that your radius, it's thicker down, it's the one that's thick down here. Okay, the ulna is pretty thin on this side. Okay, but the radius, just a way for you to tell this from that, right? And the radius is the one closest to the thumb. All right, so you can feel that there. Okay, humerus, radius, ulna. Wrists and the hands here, okay, we've got eight carpal, okay, these are these uh, little short bones there, the wrist, okay, you've got your metacarpals, okay, these are the bones there, the lower hand, and then you have the phalanges, okay, this is only for one hand, and so you both hands there, you'd have 16 carpal, 10 metacarpal, and 14 phalange, or 28. The lower limbs here, moving into the hips, okay, the opening is formed by the sacrum, ilium, and the pubis bone. Okay, there's your hip bones. Okay, there's the sacrum there. This is more. This is the axial, not the appendicular. Okay, the pelvis protects the uh, abdominal organs. Okay. I thought that this was interesting. Uh, archaeologically speaking, when you find, you know, when you do, um, you know, when you dig up graves or whatever, and uh, like in Europe, there. The uh, old Viking graves there, and you see a skeleton. How do you know, you know, uh, if this was male or female? And you can just tell there, generally there by the size, or what we call the pelvic brim. And you'll see there that the difference there between males and females. What we've got here, the females tinted, tilted forward, and it's all about childbirth. Okay, it's a little broader. Males tend to be a little narrower. Okay. And as well, you see the pubic arch. What's going on here? There's a joint right here called the pubic symphysis. Okay. It's, uh, we'll get more into that there later. There you go. Lower limbs, leg, feet. How many bones per leg? There's 30. And you'll see there that uh, there's your pelvis. There's your femur. There's your patella, tibia, fibula. Then we're into the tarsals, metatarsals, and again, the phalanges there of the feet. And you'll notice 14 phalanges of the feet, 14 phalanges of the hand. Okay, very good. Ankle and the feet, there's your, um, you see your tibia and fibula, okay? Your tibia there is the, uh, the bigger one. The fibula there is uh, just more for balance, okay? Um, and they come down and they attach there to the tarsals. There are your metatarsals and your phalanges. I always like this one there in a test. I just love it. The, cal uh, the calcaneus. That is your heel bone. Skeleton is fully ossified in the mid-20s. Okay, adults. Changes occur as a result of specific conditions. Decreased density and strength results there from pregnancy. Um, and as we said there, the uh, we have our maximum bone density in our mid-30s. But decreased density and strength results from pregnancy, nutritional deficiencies, and illness. And, you know, pregnancy there, um, mama's eating for two. So baby's going to be robbing. Baby's going to take whatever baby wants. Babies take whatever they want. Eh? They do the cutie patooties. And that's just there. So that's why uh, expecting mother there needs to eat more. And think about that. Advanced adulthood. Um... This is getting on later in age, uh, degeneration of the bone. Uh, how can we stop this here? Exercise, as we said there before, the osteocytes are, uh, if, as long as you're exercising, your bones will maintain uh, their density. And if you're not exercising outside of any type of disease like osteoporosis, where there's uh, an evil disease at work, but generally exercise will maintain that bone density. Even very light exercise can help increase bone density and strengthen older adults. Soft tissue may continue to grow, but they ossify more slowly. So bone, there, is, there, there can be bone regeneration, but it is, tends to be pretty slower in older adults. Uh, the hard bone matrix is replaced by softer connective tissue that results in a loss of strength and increased susceptibility to injury, okay? 
Speaking of injury, what is a fracture? It is any bone break. And, you know, depending upon whatever medical textbook you get, generally the, I've seen these ones here. They're in uh, the most, uh, most agreed upon. You have a green stick fracture, which isn't really a break. It's just kind of a crack. Okay. Um, and the bone generally doesn't need to be set. It'll just go back to, uh, it'll regenerate on its own. You'll have what's called a transverse fracture, which is straight through horizontally against the grain of the bone, the length of the bone. You have a spiral fracture, okay, which is, it's a bad one because these bones here, they're making blood. And if you look at the surface area that is exposed here, if you have a transverse fracture as opposed to a spiral, you have a lot more of the medullary cavity exposed, so you're going to have a lot more damage. And this, you know, the blood, the marrow, blood gets out causes trouble, right? Uh, comminuted, this one here tends to be a, kind of a devastating, you know, a, a smash and little pieces, you know, where the bone is actually in some places degenerated and just, you know, in some case, it, it's it's a really bad. How do you put this one back together? Uh, stress fracture, uh, not actually a break when the bone cracks, but doesn't break apart, common in athletes. Happens to us all the time, actually, without even us really knowing it. Um, the worst one, though, is what we call an open or a compound fracture, and this is where the bone it breaks and then punctures the skin into the outside world, okay? The worst of the worst. The um, osteoporosis, again, there's, the, there's this video, there's this video, there's the videos uh, up here. Uh, I'm not going to play any videos there just for YouTube. Um, I don't make any money off of it, but I, just, I don't want to plagiarize anybody. But there's a link there. Please watch this video. It's really good on osteoblast, osteoclast, what goes on, osteoporosis. Uh, this is a progressive disease caused by the loss of mineralization of the bone, and it leads there to an increased res uh, risk of bone fracture. Generally, this happens there in elderly people. And it's one of the most devastating diseases because, you know, uh, an older person is walking along and then, you know, they, they fall. And when they fall, they fall on their, on their bums and they'll break a hip. And lying in bed for six months to an elderly person is devastating because now muscle atrophy, bone atrophy, and in a lot of cases there, after a fall and a breaking of a hip, people don't recover. To where they used to be so just take care of those bones take care of them take care of them uh, diseases of the bone uh, here we're talking cancer osteosarcoma sarcoma means cancer is the most common primary malignant tumor of skeletal tissue and is often the most fatal okay chondrosarcoma is a malignant tumor of the hyaline cartilage okay they're articulating that arises from chondroblasts, large, bulky, slow-growing tumors that occur most often in middle-aged people. All right. Uh, metabolic bone diseases, osteoporosis, rickets, okay, osteomalacia, osteoporosis characterized by the increased bone porosity and reduced mineral density and mass of the bones. They will, bones will fracture easily. Rickets, demineralization of bones due to vitamin D deficiency in infants and young children before skeletal maturity. Devastating disease. Osteomalacia seen in adults is the loss of mineral content from bones that have already matured. Okay. Um, joints and movement. Some of these slides there you will have seen there. Uh, we introduced a joints and movement there last week. We're going to go back to these here. Uh, three kinds of joints. Uh, we're talking fibrous. Okay. Also called syndemosis. No movement. This is in the skull. Remember those flat bones there? They come together to make those sutures. Those are called fibrous joints, immovable. All right. There are cartilaginous joints. And there's two kinds of these. There's synchondrosis and symphysis. Synchondrosis, there's no movement. Ribs in the sternum. Okay, you can't move your sternum from, you can't separate your sternum from your ribs. Thank goodness. Okay, it's what we call the synchondrosis joint. Uh, symphysis joints, though, you know, and remember the pubic symphysis right in here. Slight movement, okay, intervertebral disc, symphys pubis, okay, where there's a little bit of movement required, you get it right here, okay. And then the joint with the most movement there is the synovial, also called diathroses. 
free moving knee shoulder we're going to get into these here and so you just have a look at these fibrous joints okay no movement and that's why you see when you when you sprain your ankle when you roll over on that ankle those ligaments there they're locked in and you roll over on your ankle you've stretched those ligaments now and that's called spraining your ankle all right and you stretch those ligaments man there's really nothing you can do other than lay off it for six weeks i had a friend i uh, have a friend uh, he's a great guy, but he sprained his left ankle three times and his right ankle four times. Or do I have that reversed? Anyway, that's the thing. If you don't take care of those ligaments, they will heal, but they'll heal stretched. So now that joint has movement where it shouldn't. Okay. So fibrous joints, immovable. You'll see them here. Fibrous joints, fibrous joints, fibrous joints. Okay. Uh, synovial joints free moving there's uh, the knee the elbow the shoulder okay the hip okay fingers synovial and you'll see there the cartilaginous okay there's synchrondosis no movement okay here we're talking the ribs uh, but uh, and then we have cartilaginous symphysis the greatest one there's uh, the pubic symphysis there okay a little bit of movement and intervertebral discs Moving into a little bit more detail, uh, I got to talk about synovial joints and, you know, because uh, we have knees and they're awesome. They're also called diathrosis joints, highly movable, synovial cavity filled with fluid. You know, you got to keep it all moist. Uh, articulating cartilage there, you'll see it. Okay. Uh, articulating capsule as well. Cartilage and fat pads, meniscus. Okay. Uh, channels flow of syn uh, synovial fluid, fat pads as well. Ligaments there, okay, you have your ACL, you have all the different ligaments there that are holding the uh, uh, the knee in place, all right? Uh, anterior cruciate, posterior cruciate, lateral. Uh, the uh, tendons there, they limit the range of movement and provide uh, mechanical support. Uh, bursae, these are interesting there. Thin lubricated filled uh, fluid-filled cushions, okay, at friction points. So what will happen there is uh, if someone who was working on their knees a lot, okay, for whatever reason, whatever job, whatever, make one up in your head, I don't care. The, if someone is working on their knees a lot, they'll need knee protection because if they don't, what will happen is these bursae, these fluid-filled sacs will develop there. It's just, a con it's just a protection mechanism there to protect the knee, okay? And we're just on the tail end now. That's where we're at. A couple more slides and we're out of here. Um, types of joints. You've seen these there last week there. There's your plane joint. You'll see how it moves. Okay. And here we're talking about the, um, uh, the carpals of a uh, hand. Okay. And the plane joint just moves on a flat surface. Uh, we also have the hinge joint of the elbow and it opens to a certain point and the elbow opens to 180 degrees flat and that's as far as it goes the elbow will not go any further okay so a uh, hinge joint opens to a certain point and then closes okay pivot joint here with the radius and the ulna if you hold your uh, your arm out you can rotate your forearm left and right that's what we call a pivot joint okay where it rotates upon itself we have what's called a condyloid joint, and you'll see how this one works. It's got kind of a curved surface, and it's able to rock back and forth. Okay, here again, we're talking about the wrist. Mm. Last two here, that saddle joint. You see you'll have one cowboy saddle and another cowboy saddle on top of each other, and they rock back and forth, and this is what we're talking about here within the wrist. And you have the ball and socket okay shoulder and hip where the ball fits right into the socket there it's held heavily in place but it can come out okay but just going back you guys can have a read of these there it just are it just goes into what we just saw right there you guys can have a read of those okay saddle joints there's more detail uh just going back gliding plane joints the hinge joint pivot condyloid saddle joint ball and socket have a read of those we saw these there last week there okay flexion extension abduction adduction pronation and rotation 
supination, eversion, inversion, circumduction. Please don't forget about the four movements there of the uh, mandible. Okay, that was located on the week eight PowerPoint. Uh, and that's where we are. That's all we've got for the week nine PowerPoint. That's it for the test two. Just remember that test two will be in class next week during a regular class time. There's no lecture. It's only for the test. It'll be pen and paper and mostly multiple choice. There should be some matching, some true and false. I'm making the test now, but it should, uh, it, it, I'm not worried about you guys. You guys are a great, uh, great class and uh, I expect you guys to keep Keep your A average. That's what we're looking for. So any issues with that, let me know. Just remember that test two is on week six, seven, eight, and nine. You guys have a great week and I'll be in contact there through uh, the announcements. Thanks guys. Bye for now.